Coming up on GMA, I'm here on the Mississippi River, the port of Osceola, and we've got all of these barges backed up. They are waiting to be able to move down river. They've been waiting for weeks because the river has been at historic lows. We're going to talk about the impacts to prices and when you might be feeling it. And then TikTok. The FCC commissioner says it should be banned in the U.S. We'll get into that story. Angela Bassett is live and Deals and Steals, more of Oprah's favorite things. You don't want to miss it. Coming up right here on GMA. Ahead the next hour, GMSA, do you feel tired, hungry, and thirsty all the time? You may be suffering signs of one of the most common diseases in the world. We'll tell you what you need to know. And Transguide right now, the roads are murky out there right now. Some areas more than others. We'll check in with Stephen Kamasas coming up, see how that is affecting the roads. Hopefully things are looking good for your Wednesday morning commute. And Mike has your midweek forecast. What do you see how stormy it might be for Friday night football? A scary scene on the city's west side overnight after a man was stabbed several times. We're going to tell you if any arrests have been made. And more calls this morning to ban the popular video app TikTok. Why some say it could be putting you at risk just ahead. And taking a look outside with live cam. Not too bad in this shot, but there's a lot of fog in some areas. Be careful out there. We'll be checking in with Mike very soon. Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Good morning to you. It is Wednesday, November 2nd. Thanks for joining us. Hope you had a good week so far. Uh, 59 degrees, pretty tolerable, but the big issue this morning is the fog. Fog and quite a bit of it in some areas, some affecting more than others. Where are the big problem spots this morning, Mike? Overall, it's to the east and to the northeast, but then you head up I-10 in toward Bernie Stage and there's a lot of thick fog. Head over toward U Valley, there's a lot of thick fog there. So it is very, very patchy, but in some places it is definitely uh, kind of pea soup out there. Now this picture, uh, if you were with us uh, roughly an hour and a half ago, it was very, very foggy, but now it looks almost like a, a normal morning out there going up I-10 in toward the hill country. Quarter mile visibility, Bernie stage, a half mile Kerrville, half mile at Uvalde, and then up 35. New Braunfels, just a quarter mile visibility. It's improved slightly out there at the airport as well as at uh, Port SA. Port SA was down to about three quarters of a mile visibility just uh, roughly a half an hour ago. Some fog around Eagle Pass as well going up in toward Austin. The dense fog advisory up until 10 o'clock is just to our northeast, uh, say, quadrant of the area. Up I-35 going out I-10. This is up until 10 o'clock this morning. And as we approach sunrise, in some cases, it will get thicker. Mold is on the high side. The update account is going to be coming out in about an hour, hour and a half or so. 60 this morning. Temperatures, because of the, the very high humidity, because of the cloud cover out there, are going to be staying steady. And even though it's not bone chilling, it's kind of that dampish cool this morning. So you want to definitely take a jacket. And then it's going to be hot and humid today because uh, the humidity is going to continue to come in here. 69 at noon, some sunshine. Don't be surprised if there's a little sprinkly shower out there just because that humidity keeps getting pumped on in here. So we'll be up in the mid 70s at almost 10 to that for tomorrow and then Friday is going to be on the hot side as well. That's setting the stage though as the next front moves on through here and we can see some potentially strong storms later on Friday. In behind that, still setting up for a fantastic weekend. Details coming up in just a couple of minutes. Traffic Authority, Stephen, any big problems out there? You know, Mike, it's actually been pretty quiet and we're happy to report that because as you get a look around town, of course, we saw some of those areas where Trans Guide is picking up a little bit of that patchy fog, as you were just mentioning, but 35 at Eisenhower, traffic looks pretty normal now. You can take a look around town, 410, right there at Harry Wurzbach, still some light traffic out in that direction, but 37 at Fair Avenue, it does appear that we may be seeing a few more folks out there in this shot at Trans Guide. But let's get you to our map because while these trans guide cameras aren't really showing a whole lot, we're seeing more green here on the screen than anything else. Of course, uh, there's always going to be those active road closures you need to be on the lookout for. More on that a little bit later on in this newscast. But right now, I would say it is a good time to head out before the commute starts getting a little bit busier. We're in that 6 a.m. hour, so we all know it's going to change pretty rapidly within the next 30 minutes or so. But let's get you to those travel times if I can get my clicker to work here. All right, 29 minutes. It's still pretty green from Seguin on I 10 westbound. If you're traveling in this early in the morning to the Alamo City, 33 minutes for our friends in Lavernia traveling in those northbound lanes of 87. And for our friends down in Floresville, you can expect 28 minutes for your drive time to San Antonio. So thankfully, there are no delays here. And of course, as we get back to these trans guide cameras, things have looked a lot better. They are right there at I-10 West at Loop 410. Uh, but traffic is, of course, picking up. We're going to watch the roads closely and have those updates throughout the morning. Mark Stuff. Thank you, Stephen. 
And right now we want to get to late breaking news. All eyes among firefighters on the northeast side are on a bar that's burning. The fire broke out a little more than an hour ago near the corner of Nacogdoches and Thousand Oaks. And our Katrina Weber is there with a live report. Katrina, you mentioned earlier there appeared to be smoke in two different areas. Is that a sign there are two separate fires? Well, it definitely could be a sign of that, but we just don't know at this point. We have not had a chance to talk to anyone here. But one thing I did notice is that, yeah, there was smoke on the two ends of the building. Now, just within the last few minutes, they opened those doors really wide and all of the smoke has just been pouring out, very thick smoke. Firefighters earlier were saying they didn't know what the source of that smoke was, but they believed they had a fire going on and that smoke has continued to pour out of this building. The sign out front says this is midnight rodeo. When I searched online, I found that uh, it, this bar is permanently closed. At least that's what it says when you Google this location. But uh, not closed this morning because firefighters have been in and out of that building trying to uh, put out the fire, trying to find the source of the fire. Again, a lot of heavy smoke, a lot of firefighters here. We have more than 40 units and they've been here uh, since about five o'clock or so, a little bit before five o'clock. Now we do have a public information officer who has arrived here at the scene. He has not given us a briefing just yet. He's trying to collect that information. So we hope by next half hour we will have some definite details on exactly what, ha what has been happening here. Reporting live on the Northeast side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Katrina, thank you. A man is in the hospital this morning after he was stabbed several times overnight on the city's west side. This all unfolding around three this morning at a home on West Poplar Street, not far from Culebra and North Zarzamora. Police say the victim and the suspect both live at the house and got into an argument that turned violent. The victim stabbed in the stomach, legs and arms. His condition is unclear right now. The suspect st suspect rather is still on the run. And we are less than a week away from election night with early voting continuing through Friday. Sarah Costa live in the KSAT newsroom with what you need to know before you head to the polls and a preview of the biggest race in Texas. Sarah, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, staff. Early voting continues, and right now more than 244,000 voters have cast a ballot. During the last midterm, more than 551,000 votes total were cast in 2018. Registered voters can vote at any polling site during the early voting period. That goes until this Friday, November 4th, or vote at any polling site on Election Day on November 8th. There will be 51 polling places open daily throughout the early voting period. Early voting hours this week are from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And one of the biggest races in Texas that received national attention is the Texas governor's race. KSAT extended invitations four months ago to do sit down one on one interviews with both candidates individually. The interviews would run, run during early voting. Only one candidate took us up on that offer. Tonight, KSAT Steve Spreester's interview with Beto O'Rourke will air on the night beat at 10 p.m. In that interview, O'Rourke talks about the issues like abortion, gun control, and the border. He also talks about his bond with the parents of the mass shooting of the victims in Uvalde and the one question that surprised him. Governor Greg Abbott will be in Bear County on Thursday, and we will cover what he has to say during his visit. You can head over to KSAT.com for everything you need to know about Election Day. Mark and Stephanie. Sarah, thank you. The man accused of attacking Paul Pelosi, the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, is being held in jail without bail. David DePap pleaded not guilty in a California courtroom on Tuesday. A preliminary hearing and bail setting is scheduled for Friday. Among the state, he's facing included uh, attempted murder, burglary and assault with a deadly weapon. Authority say DePap attacked Paul Pelosi, husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, early Friday with a hammer, fracturing his skull. DePap's lawyer says his team will do a comprehensive investigation into the incident. And in California, the parents of a teen who was killed by police will receive an $8 million settlement. The L.A. County Board of Supervisors approved the settlement for the parents of Andres Guadardo. The 18-year-old was shot five times in the back by an L.A. County Sheriff's Deputy, Miguel Vega, back in June of 2020. Guadardo's death ruled a homicide in January 2021. His family released a statement saying in part that justice will only come once Vega is held criminally responsible for Guadardo's death. In your GMA first look as the holiday travel season approaches, Delta pilots are threatening to strike and United pilots will begin picketing soon. Look for that story and more coming up at 7 right here on KSAT 12.
Topping your morning consumer headlines, a whole lot of eyes on the Fed today, wrapping up its latest two-day meeting and widely expected to boost interest rates by another three-quarters of 1%. It'd be the fourth straight increase of that size. Stock traders will be looking to Fed Chair Jerome Powell's comments after the interest rate announcement for any hints of what may happen next month, with many hoping the central bank uh, easing the pace of its hikes, possibly down to a half point in December. Job openings jumping unexpectedly in September. The Labor Department says employers posted 10.7 million jobs, up around 400,000 from August. Economists had expected that number to go down. Twitter Blue is going to cost more money. Twitter subscription service going from $5 a month to 8 New CEO Elon Musk says subscribers will see fewer ads and will be able to post longer videos. Time now, 6.09 and 59 degrees for now. Glad you're with us. Much more to come on the morning show, including a preview of Game 4 of the World Series. Houston needs a big win after getting blown out in Philadelphia last night. And just ahead, the renewed calls for the banning of TikTok and why some consider the social media platform to be dangerous. Outside with live cam, storms are in the extended forecast. Mike will tell you which day coming up right here live on GMSA. And welcome back at 613. There's a new push to ban TikTok, one of the most popular social media platforms. One U.S. official is warning TikTok is not just another video app. ABC's Andrea Fujii explains. This morning, one of five commissioners at the FCC is now pushing to ban TikTok in the U.S. Brendan Carr says a ban is the only way to ensure data does not get into the hands of TikTok's Chinese parent company, ByteDance. Carr telling the website Axios, there is not sufficient protection on the data that you could have sufficient confidence that it's not finding its way back into the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. The kind of data that TikTok collects is theoretically, it's very sensitive. It could be anything from an email address to uh, something as significant as a, 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 pr a digital print of your face called a face print. TikTok's parent company has been negotiating with the Committee on Foreign Investment on how it can continue operating here under a possible sale to a U.S. firm. When you start getting a look at what China could do with the information, they could do things potentially like, you know, use it to further target people for hacks. TikTok has denied claims that China gathers the data of TikTok users, but a recent report from BuzzFeed claimed TikTok engineers in China did gain access to some users' personal information. And Forbes reported the company had planned to use the app to monitor some users' locations. The FCC does not regulate TikTok, but lawmakers do listen when FCC commissioners voice an opinion. TikTok says they support data privacy legislation that applies to all companies. Andrea Fuji, ABC News, New York. Time check is 615. Let's get a look at the commute uh, getting busier as always expected for tenant Kulabda traffic coming right at us there from that trans guide camera. So just expect to see some more vehicles out there if you plan to head out this morning. I would say drink your coffee now if you can don't drink it on the road because obviously we've had some areas that have been impacted by some of that patchy fog we've been talking about throughout the morning. But you can see there are US 98 couples the commute picking up especially there at 281 at Hildebrand watch out for that curb over there. But thankfully there are no issues to report as we get you right to that map. You just see a lot of green out there and of course those active road closures that you can expect to see take place throughout the month of November. Now let's talk about what's taking place here off of State Highway 46 in Comal County. I mentioned this last week, but we're going to continue to see that work take place. It's striping work and keep in mind this is one of those uh, situations that's going to take place all the way up until Friday, November 4th, begin at 9 in the evening and should finish around 5 in the morning. Expect single lane closures in both directions. That'll be from Old Bernie Road to uh, Bentwood Drive, but that information has been updated on our website. Grab your phones right now if you're still at home. <laughs> Scan this QR code by opening your camera app. Tap the center of the screen that will take you to our KSAT traffic page. If you scroll to the bottom, there is a full list of closures there. But back on TransGuide, things have been moving uh, along just fine, considering that we do have some of that fog out there. That's good. And mm -hmm. in places, I mean, it's still really, really thick. In some areas, it has yep. improved tremendously, but that doesn't mean we're, we're done with it as of yet. So yeah. just kind of kind of keep that in mind. So are uh, we going to get the bus rolling here this morning? Maybe not. Too foggy nope. for the bus. Nope. <laughs> nope. No bus. Too foggy yeah, for that. It's there hey, somewhere, Mike. Speaking of buses, though, make sure you do watch out uh, in yeah. and around some of the bus stops because it's Definitely. the type of situation where you can kind of turn the corner and then just sort of run into, you know, some of this, uh, this fog out there. So uh, visibility right now at the airport is three miles. It was down to 
about a 16th of a mile, basically 100 yards or so a couple of hours ago. So it has improved. Bernie stage, quarter mile, a half mile visibility up in Kerrville, quarter mile in New Braunfels, same thing over there in Uvalde and in and around the metropolitan area. Uh, we've got four miles at Port SA. That was down to about three quarters of a mile, just roughly half hour, 45 minutes ago. And then a lot more thick fog heading up to the northeast and out to the east. And that's where the dense fog advisory is. This has has not been expanded since it was issued earlier this morning and it goes up 35 and 10 up until 10 o'clock this morning. So again, it's going to be sticking around. It's only 617 right now, so we've got another three, four hours worth of some of this fog around here. Mid upper 50s, low 60s all around the area. Temperatures are slightly above normal. Really not going to move all that much this morning just because we do have a lot of this fog, low clouds, all the humidity out there. So we'll stay steady. It's kind of that dampish cool as well. When you get to all this moisture in the atmosphere. It sort of draws the, the heat away from your body. It actually conducts the heat away from your body. So that's why it feels kind of cooler on a morning like this. We'll have a little bit more sunshine thrown on in here, uh, sort of like yesterday. We're going to be going back and forth with the clouds at times, and then I've got that 10% chance of a sprinkle or two. That would be the extent of it. It's just because all the moisture is going to continue to get pumped on in here, so it could just kind of you know, let loose with a couple of little sprinkles here or there, which computer models, I mean, hardly even picking anything up, but just don't be surprised if there's one or two of them out there later on this afternoon, even going into this evening or perhaps uh, overnight hours into tomorrow morning and then it's going to be even hotter tomorrow mid 70s today mid 80s tomorrow and very humid then we go into friday and we'll have a couple of showers thunderstorms around during the day then we have the severe threat as the front approaches late friday night so just a uh, isolated potentially severe storms out to the west and then the eastern two-thirds of the area going to be kind of scattered in nature as that front works its way across here it does look like the front is going to some of the latest uh, data show that it's going to be moving through probably just after midnight uh, Saturday morning, and the winds are going to be shifting around. It's going to clear things out very quickly, but prior to that coming through, that's when we are going to be under the gun for some of those stronger storms. 69 at noon today, mostly cloudy skies, high temperature up to 76. Again, partly sunny. A shower or two is possible. Not very likely, though. Just one or two of those little sprinkly showers. Kind of hot and humid tomorrow. I mean, humidity is going to continue to pump on in here the next couple of days. We'll still be in the low 80s on Friday. And with all that humidity and the atmosphere is going to be kind of volatile. Best way to describe it on Friday. So as the front moves through, some of those storms are going to be stronger Friday night late. And then we clear out again. Saturday and Sunday look perfect. Squeezing right in there in between the next uh, batch of humidity that moves on in. Mm, at least a nice weekend, though. Yeah, great looking fall weekend. Thank you, Mike. 620, 59 degrees. The high school volleyball postseason is here. After the break, a recap from one of last night's top matchups. When moderate to severe ulcerative colitis persists, put it in check with Rinvoke, a once daily pill. When UC got unpredictable, I got rapid symptom relief with Rinvoke. Check. When UC held me back, I got lasting steroid free remission with Rinvoke. Check. And when UC got the upper hand, Rinvoke helped visibly repair the colon lining. Check. Rapid symptom relief, lasting steroid free remission, and a chance to visibly repair the colon lining. Check, check, and check. Rinvoke can lower your ability to fight infections, including TB, serious infections and blood clots, some fatal, cancers, including lymphoma and skin cancer, death, heart attacks, stroke, and tears in the stomach or intestines occur. People 50 and older with at least one heart disease risk factor have higher risks. Don't take if allergic to Rinvoke, as serious reactions can occur. Tell your doctor if you are or may become pregnant. Put UC in check and keep it there with Rinvoke. Ask your gastroenterologist about Rinvoke and learn how AbbVie could help you save. 623 in morning sports. Volleyball playoffs are finally here. And a number of local teams punched their tickets onto the next round in style on Tuesday night. One of the marquee matchups featuring the defending Class A 6A rather, state champ Brandeis Broncos taking on steel. KSAT 12 Sports' Andrew Seeley was there and has more. With the match tied at one set apiece and trailing early in the third, Brandeis showed their championship pedigree and put together an impressive run as the Broncos rallied to defeat Steele three sets to one and punched their tickets to the Class 6A second round. 
we just really wanted it because we, we put so much work in the gym and we just really wanted to show that we could do it. So I think there was just like a turning point that we know we can do it, so we just have to put it on the court. We knew that we needed to make less errors and be more consistent, and we did that, and it really showed, especially in the last two sets. The Broncos may be defending champs, but this is a very different unit from the one that won it all last year. So current seniors like Emma Halstead are keeping the team level-headed. We're not going to look too far ahead. We're going to keep moving and we're going to keep pushing because each new challenge could, and for anybody in playoffs, the next challenge could be your last. So we're going to push one at a time and keep going. Meanwhile, MacArthur is celebrating their first playoff win since 2010. The Bramas moved down to Class 5A this season, and they swept Medina Valley in the first round. It feels good just coming back and showing what Matt can really do. It really just shows how much our team can come together and really push through a tough match and ultimately come out with a win. You can catch full highlights from both of these matches, as well as Burbank versus Harlandale and Highlands versus Southwest, right now on the BGC page at KSAT.com. For Good Morning San Antonio, I'm Andrew Seeley. 625, 59 degrees. And still ahead on GMSA, we are staying on top of this morning's late breaking news on the northeast side of town, where crews are responding to a fire at a bar. At least 43 fire units on the scene at one point. Transcribe flashing lights there. It says I-35 at I-37 viewing 35 North. We'll verify the direction with Stephen Cavazos coming up. Firefighters are called to rush in while smoke pours out of a northeast side bar. Good morning, I'm Katrina Weber. I'll tell you why the fire here may not interrupt any business. Giving away pitches. Schwarber flies it to center field. McCormick's going back. He's at the track. He's at the wall. Gone! Wow! Monstrous blast! Oh my goodness, a rough night for the Houston Astros who were on the road in Game 3 of the World Series. Can they bounce back tonight? In game four, we're going to have a preview. Outside with live camp just now waking up. Wow, what an improvement from a couple of hours ago out there by the airport. Mike Ostrange has your Wednesday forecast coming up, so we've been tracking some fairly dense but patchy fog. Good morning, everybody. It's Wednesday, the 2nd of November. Hi, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, the fog looks better. Uh, Humidity is still out there, though. Oh, noticed it first thing this morning. Let the windows open last night. It was brisk last night. This morning, a little swampy. Yeah, and it's going to get more humid throughout the course of today tomorrow, Friday preceding, and then it gets gets out of here by the weekend. But between now and the weekend, things will get interesting. OK, just because this picture has improved doesn't mean it's improved everywhere. We've got 60 degrees out there at the airport. Dew point stands at 58. So yes, relative to that temperature. Now that's still below 60, but relative to that temperature, extremely high humidity. And it, it's kind of that dampish cool. So it, on a morning like this, it actually feels a little chillier than the actual air temperature were lower. Quarter mile visibility up the road at Bernie Stage. Randolph now is just at a mile and two thirds. So that has dropped down. A lot of thick fog up around New Braunfels, over by Uvalde. But, you know, in between, say, Port SA and Uvalde, it's fairly clear out there. Hondo's 10 miles visibility, but it drops down again. Kerrville, Fredericksburg, some fog, and then going up in toward Austin. Dense fog advisory is still uh, just for our northeastern counties, north and east up I-10, uh, excuse me, out I-10, up I-35, and that's in effect up until 10 o'clock this morning. Temperatures are really consistent, haven't moved all that much because of the high humidity, because of the cloud cover that we have out there. So mid upper 50s, low 60s around here, and we do have a lot of mold in the atmosphere. This was yesterday's reading. The updated count will come out in about the say half hour to an hour. So patchy thick fog this morning. Partly sunny, mid 70s, close to normal, but it is going to be humid. Humidity continues to come on in here, and as it pumps on in, we are going to be seeing maybe a couple, as we call them, little streamer showers around, just one or two. That's going to be the situation tomorrow as well, but it's going to be hotter, mid 80s tomorrow, well above normal, almost 10 degrees warmer than today. It's going to be warm and humid on Friday as well, but as the front moves on through here late Friday night, that's going to touch off some storms, potentially strong to severe storms late, late Friday night. Then looks like that front's going to be coming through 
as we sleep Saturday morning. And so when you wake up, it's going to be a whole different story. We have got a fantastic weekend in store. All those details coming up in just a couple of minutes. Traffic Authority, Stephen, despite the fog, maybe yeah. damp roads, not bad. It hasn't been bad until right now, Mike. Unfortunately, right there, right. We almost made it through in the morning, but now we're in that busy time. And of course, those issues are going to pop up. Uh, we have the view here at 35 at 37 and spoke to our friends at Transguide over the phone. What we're looking at is actually a crash. They were along 281 northbound, and as you can see, vehicles are getting by, and we're really not seeing a whole lot of trouble out there, at least from this shot at Transguide. Now, our map is a little bit of a different situation as we get you right to it, because as you see there, there's a little bit of red that's building up on the northbound lanes of 281. Also on 35, as people are trying to make their way onto 281, but keep in mind, this is being reported in the far right interchange, which is why we are seeing a, a light buildup right now. So as always, we hope everyone's doing OK out there, but just make sure that you drive carefully. It has been a pretty quiet morning overall, despite some of that patchy fog that we've been talking about throughout the morning. But we are already seeing a few of those slowdowns taking place. Just take a look right over here. A little bit of orange and yellow building new uh, on US 90 as you approach 1604 on the far west side. And of course, right over here near 1604 on the northwest side as well. But that's typical. We are getting into that busy hour as morning rush. But let's get back to this situation here at 35 at 37. The view from Transguide. I just sent a tweet about this, but we're going to watch it closely throughout the morning. Mark Steph. Thank you, Stephen. A thick cloud of smoke hanging over a northeast sidebar. San Antonio firefighters also are at that building near Nacogdoches and Thousand Oaks trying to put out a fire. Katrina Weber has a live report from the scene. Have they figured out what started the blaze, Katrina? Uh, they have not figured out the cause just yet, but I was just talking to the public information officer briefly. He says it looks like this fire is in a hard to get to area, and that is why there's been so much smoke. This is a whole different scene from what you probably saw last half hour. You can't even see the building now. No visibility because of all the smoke pouring out of this building. But there was a sign on the front of the building that says Midnight Rodeo. And according to uh, what I was just told, this business has been shut down since 2019. So it's been an empty building. I've heard from people in this area that there are uh, homeless people who hang around in this vicinity, but we don't know whether they had anything to do with the fire. All of that's still unknown. But firefighters have been having a real tough time since about five o'clock this morning, just trying to get to that fire and put it out. And again, a lot of thick smoke. Now, where we are, uh, I can tell you, it's, it's kind of burns your nose and your throat. I can't imagine what it's like to be inside that building with all this smoke, but that's what firefighters have been doing for the past uh, hour and a half or so. Now, uh, Fire Chief Charles Hood is here at the scene. We're about to get a briefing from him in just a few minutes, and we'll bring you that information uh, that he shares with us uh, as soon as we have it. Reporting live on the northeast side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Katrina. Today marks one month since 17-year-old Eric Gantu was shot by a former San Antonio police officer. A vigil at the McDonald's where those shots were fired was held last night. Sarah Costa joins us in the studio and newsroom with an update on Gantu's condition from his family. Sarah. Good morning, Mark and Steph. Eric's mother, Victoria Casada, says Eric is scheduled to have an invasive surgery later today. She and the family were not able to attend last night's vigil, but wrote a letter to those that were there. So SAPD officer James Brennan shot the 17 year old on October 2nd in the north side McDonald's parking lot while Gantu sat inside his car while eating a burger. Brennan has since been fired and now faces charges. According to SAPD records viewed by KSAT investigates, Gantu evaded Brennan on October 1st in the same maroon BMW sedan he was driving the following night when he was shot, those records indicate. The teenage female passenger who was with Gantu when he was shot by Brennan told police that during the October 1st incident, Gantu disregarded the emergency lights and sped off after an officer attempted to pull Gantu over while they drove along a north side highway not far from that McDonald's. Organizers of a vid candlelight vigil for Gantu also stated in a letter to the community that Brennan, quote, racially profiled Eric as a Hispanic kid with a bowl cut haircut in a car that he may or may not have recognized as stolen, end quote. During last night's vigil, prayers poured in from the community. One of Gantu's close friend says he is praying he can pull through. I love my best friend. He's like a brother to me. He's family. And justice needs to be served for what that man did to my family. Nobody deserves to be shot that many times. In a statement, Gantu's mother said, quote, James Brennan didn't have to gun down my child. He didn't have to mutilate his young body with bullets. 
Eric is the light of our lives. All we want for him is to recover, end quote. You can read the family's full statement that we have on our website at ksat.com. The family says they've been living at the hospital by Eric's side this entire time. Mark and Steph. Thank you, Sarah. Viente Uno for Viente Uno, 21 for 21. That was demand heard on the state capitol steps Tuesdays as families of the Valley victims mourn their loved ones for Dia de los Muertos. As our Lee Waldman reports, they're still fighting for gun law changes ahead of Election Day next week. An ofrenda with the faces of the 21 victims killed at Robb Elementary was carried from the Capitol steps to the governor's mansion by the families still grieving the loss of their loved ones and fighting for change. Unfortunately, my son's not here anymore because he was taken from us because these laws aren't changed. I really wish she really wasn't that known. That would mean she'd still be here with us. But unfortunately, everybody does know it. Holding in tears and pictures of their loved ones, the families of Uvalde victims were back on the Capitol steps calling for gun law changes, like raising the age to purchase an assault-style weapon to 21, implementing red flag laws, and increasing background checks. It's something Lexi's mom, Kimberly Rubio, has asked for before. Some of you might recognize these words I used on, John, on June 8th when I addressed Congress. Why am I repeating myself? because not a damn thing has changed. Carrying the ofrenda down the street to the governor's mansion, those calls continued, met with quiet sobs as marigolds were laid in tribute. It's a part of most of our cultures, but we shouldn't have to have our children on an ofrenda in front of the governor's mansion. I just appreciate all of us sticking together through it, you know. Um, we're one big family. Now we're not 21 families anymore, just one big family. The hope was this Marcha de los Niños Children's March would encourage more people to get out to the polls and vote next week. One of the messages we heard on Tuesday was that children's lives are on the ballot. At the governor's mansion in Austin, Lee Waldman for GMSA. And back here in San Antonio, a crowd of over 70 people walked from Confluence Park to Mission Concepcion outside the mission. An altar was set to honor Texans killed in mass shootings. 21 photos of the victims from Rivaldi were prominent. The event was hosted and attended by Democratic state and local leaders. It was hosted by the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus. Well, if you haven't heard yet or noticed, No Shave November is back this year, and so are the beards and mustaches in progress. Right, the cause is part of an effort which raises funds that go toward cancer research, treatment, and prevention. Stephen Cavazos, once again, team captain this year for Team KSAT, joins us more here in the studio. Good morning, Captain. Good morning, guys. And you know what? Uh, scruff is coming in nice for you and Mike. I just ran into Justin Horn, who's also helping us with our campaign this year. Yeah. Everyone's looking pretty hairy around that here. Handsome devil, no, Justin it's Horn. It's a little, I got a little. <laughs> bit of beard envy on my end but <laughs> hey uh, in a little bit you're going to need those phones and we'll tell you why but first let's tell you about how this has become an annual tradition for men around the country a time we ditch those razor blades and grow out our facial hair but as we all know no shave november holds a special meaning and for team ksat it's also personal last year 15 guys from our newsroom you could see a few of them right there steve spreester and mark of course and david looking like a happy camper right over there <laughs> <laughs> participated in the fundraising efforts some shared their stories about how cancer has touched their lives, which made our campaign that much more important. Now, last year, our original goal was to raise $10,000, but our donors helped us exceed our expectations. We raised over $20,000, and that money, as we mentioned earlier, went back to cancer research, treatment, and prevention. Now, the fundraising efforts began in 2009 when the Hill family of Chicago lost their father, Matthew Hill, to colon cancer. His children started a Facebook group to help raise money. Since then, their mission has grown across the country. Over the past two years, we've really broadened our horizons because different causes just, just mean so much to different people. We have some uh, that are lobbying on Capitol Hill for better uh, research funds and treatments for cancer patients. We have others that are helping patients boots on the ground. So we put our money where our mouth is and we give back every single thing we can to organizations that are doing great work. 
And here is a look at the guys that are taking part this year. And we have them joined from all parts of our newsroom. We talked about this yesterday. Our photographers, meteorologists, anchors, reporters. Now, as I mentioned, each one has their own reason for participating in this great cause. And we're going to share their stories throughout the month of November. And as I mentioned, grab those phones and you can scan that QR code. That will take you directly to our case at No Shave page. And you can find a link there to donate to any member of the team or to any one of our uh, guys here on GMSA or any show that we have on case at 12 but at the end of the day our goal is to raise at least twenty thousand dollars that will benefit 13 cancer foundations and we all know that money is going to get, help a great cause this year and the uh, donations have already started to pour yeah. in steven's yes. going to be humble but well i'll, I'll brag for him <laughs> yes. he's number one right now yeah I'm number, i don't have to be humble about that because this is a friendly <laughs> competition i'm number one so you know we talk we talk about mike has team uh team graybeard Team gray, hair. So, gray hair, so, so. gray hair, gray yeah. hair. Oh, okay, yeah, and or white, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just team mustache this year, Mark. I mean, this is the fun part about it, but yeah. we all know every dollar counts, and so we just it want does. to see our team uh, reach uh, twenty thousand dollars. So that's our goal. All right, okay. on our way, all Stephen. Right, thank you. Thank we'll you. see you in a minute for a traffic update. The World Series continues tonight. In Philadelphia. Philadelphia leads the series two games to one right now. The best of seven, and some would call tonight's game a must win for Houston. Last night. A horrible night for the Astros. Phillies got right to work right away, scoring two runs in the first and two more in the second. In total, Philly hit five homers. Astros never got any offensive rhythm going. Philly wins game three in a blowout. Uh, final, Phillies win seven to nothing in game three last night. So Houston looks to bounce back in game four. Also in Philadelphia, first pitch tonight right around seven o'clock. Unfortunately, the uh, tonight and tomorrow night still in Philadelphia. They got to win one of these games yes. on the road. All right, we certainly hope that happens. Last night was ugly. 643, 59 degrees. And are you tired, hungry all the time and just can't seem to quench your thirst? Well, you may be suffering the signs of one of the most common diseases in the world. What you need to know just ahead. Hi, November is Diabetes, Diabetes Awareness Month, and more than 30 million people here in the U.S. are living with type 2 diabetes. And nearly 25% of those people don't even know they have it. That's because they don't know the symptoms or they don't see a doctor regularly. Sarah's back, joining now separating fact from fiction when it comes to type 2 diabetes. Hey. Hey, good morning, guys. So by 2050, experts believe that as many as one in th every three people in the U.S. will be affected by type 2 diabetes. And the reality is many people don't know much about it. So let's get right to some of those most asked questions. First, if no one in your immediate family has it, then you can't get it. That's actually false. Although having a family member puts you at higher risk, the risk of diabetes is higher in people with heart disease, high blood pressure, and those who are also overweight. All right, let's get to the next question. Does eating too much sugar cause diabetes? That's actually a trick question. Eating sugar does not directly cause diabetes, but a sugary diet can lead to obesity, which is a major risk factor. And research shows sugary drinks also raise blood sugar. All right, let's get to another question. Does diabetes only affect overweight people? And that answer, of course, is no. You can see it on your screen there. It is false. The CDC reports 11% of people with type 2 diabetes are neither overweight or obese. Experts agree it is important to recognize these symptoms early. And get this, diabetes causes more death per year than breast cancer and AIDS combined. And having diabetes nearly doubles your chance of having a heart attack. I also wanted to highlight that not all people have type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes affects 5 to 10 percent of that. And people don't understand that type 1 diabetes, there is no cure. You can't just diet and exercise and be cured, which can basically cure you of type 2 diabetes. Type 1 um, are very insulin dependent, and a lot of research still needs to be done on type 1 diabetes. Okay, yeah. thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you. And at 648, let's go ahead and check in with Stephen Cavazos. Yeah, still big problems out here, guys. 37 at 35 at 37 is a view from Trans Guide. We have this crash that is already causing a mess of problems for drivers. Just check this out. This is actually right on the northbound lanes of 281, not far from the Pearl Parkway. Now, those southbound lanes of 281 aren't really seeing much of an impact, but it's if you're traveling on uh, trying to get onto those northbound lanes, you're going to see that problem there. We know that that entrance ramp is closed off right now due to this crash, and you can see vehicles are almost bumper to 
to bumper there, which is why we're also seeing that build up along 35 northbound as you approach 281. So this will likely be the issue of the morning, but we're going to have to watch it closely. As always, we hope everyone's doing OK out there. But right now it does appear slowdowns are what's going to really be plaguing drivers this morning, Mike. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, and watch out for the fog because, you know, we've been watching this camera a couple of hours ago. It was very, very thick. It has improved tremendously. The other thing you have to watch out for, if there is some fog, like going up I-10 and toward Bernie Stage, going out uh, 10 eastward or uh, eastbound, I should say, or going up I-35, there may be a little bit of mist with some of this thicker fog as it just kind of hangs there right on the surface. Same thing over there in toward Uvalde. Randolph has now dropped down to just a half mile visibility but then Port SA has improved Stinson at night. So again, it's one of the situations where you can kind of turn the corner and run into some of this fog and visibility then out there in Fredericksburg is a half mile, just three quarters of a mile in Austin. Dense fog advisory still in effect. Northeastern quadrant, if you will, of our viewing area. And this is up until 10 o'clock this morning. So at times it will continue to get thicker because of the very high humidity and cloud cover. Temperatures aren't going anywhere this morning. We'll stay where you are mid upper 50s, low 60s, and then some sunshine thrown in later on today, kind of like what we had yesterday, kind of going back and forth with the clouds and the sunshine. Then there's that 10% chance for a sprinkly shower or two, high of 76 today. Because the humidity is going to continue to pump on in here, there may be one or two, and computer models aren't doing a great job picking it up. Again, one or two little sprinkly showers here or there, just again, because that humidity keeps getting pumped on in here overnight and through tomorrow too. So tomorrow is actually going to be kind of hot and humid with temperatures well up into the, uh, the mid 80s. Then we jump ahead to Friday. We'll have some scattered showers and storms around the area, and then there is the chance for some of those to become strong to potentially severe. The atmosphere is kind of volatile, if you will, on Friday, and this is going to be late Friday night. Front will be coming through then, looks like just after midnight Saturday morning, and that's going to clear things out nicely. But right up until that time, that's when we're going to have to be on the lookout for some of those stronger storms Friday night. 69 degrees today at noon, mostly cloudy skies, high temperature today. Makes it up to 76, about in the ballpark of where we should be, but a lot more humidity, a sprinkly shower or two. Tomorrow, a couple of sprinkly showers, 84 degrees, plenty of humidity out there. You're definitely going to feel it. And then Friday, a few showers around as the front approaches late Friday night. Some of those storms could be on the strong side. And then the weekend looks absolutely fantastic. Of course, set your clocks back before you go to bed Saturday night. Beautiful, beautiful weather this weekend. Humidity comes right back in by the first of next week. Steph, Mark. Thank you very much, Mike. 652, 59 degrees. And believe it or not, some people are already beginning their Christmas shopping. Coming up tomorrow on GMSA, we're going to tell you how inflation is impacting this holiday season and how you can save some money while gift giving. Outside with live cam, let's check on the fog. Visually, right now, things look so much better than they did around 430 when we went on the air this morning. We'll wrap up the morning show after this break. All right, time check. Before you head out the door, 655. We still have these flashing lights out there, 35 at 37. The crash is actually reported along 281 northbound near the Pearl Parkway. That entrance ramp looks like it's blocked off, and it's causing a slowdown for drivers, but uh, really the only issue we're reporting right now. Watch out for some fog around the area. It is very patchy, but it is definitely thick out there, and we do have a dense fog advisory for northeastern counties up until 10 o'clock. High today, 76. All right. Thank you, Mike. Give me a nice day. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you back here at 9. Good Morning America is next.